bless the Lord, O oh my soul, and all that is within me. Bless his holy name, who forgives all of our iniquities and who heals all of our diseases. and welcome to the broadcast. We're glad you could join us today. And again, uh, this is uh, uh, the month of, of Thanksgiving, the month of November where, in which we celebrate Thanksgiving. We are spending this entire month talking about the spirit of Thanksgiving. Now, I want to invite you to uh, sign in and uh, let anybody know that you uh, can think of that might need a word of encouragement today, and particularly today because we're going to talk about the uh, history and the origin of Thanksgiving. Um, to do that, of course, we've got to go back to the Word of God because our thanksgiving is to God. And a lot of people may not realize this as far as the holiday is concerned. 
but this coming Thursday, you know, we'll all be sitting down to a, a great meal. And I know you've probably heard a lot of things and learned a lot of things and mislearned some things. I know that I did. I early on, I uh, uh, in school when they taught us the tradition of Thanksgiving, it was about the uh, American uh, settlers, the Pilgrims, that is, uh, uh, giving thanks to the Indians for saving their lives so forth and so on, but it's much, much more complex than that, and uh, it behooves us to go to the Word of God, first of all, to see what the real foundation of thanksgiving is. So let's go to 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 once again and read the scripture that we've been looking at. It says in verse um, 14, Now we exhort you, brethren, warn them that are unruly, comfort the feeble-minded, support the weak, be patient toward all men. See that none render evil for evil unto any man, but ever follow that which is good, both among yourselves and to all men. Verse 16 says, Rejoice evermore. Verse 17, Pray without ceasing. And then verse 18 says, In everything give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. Then verse 19, it says, Quench not the Spirit. Now, last time we were talking about how that our thanksgiving and quenching the Spirit go hand in hand. He tells us not to quench the spirit, but precedes that immediately by in everything giving thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. And I think it's important that we recognize that a thankful attitude is what enables God and the Spirit of God to work in our lives and work in our midst, fully work. Because you see, when you're, when you're uh, overburdened and, and worried and uh, full of uh, anxiety and fearful about the future, you, you tend not to hear from God. You tend not to pick up His cues. You hear not to uh, sense His impulses and hear His whispers. And it's so important that if we're going to be uh, blessed by the Spirit of God, we've got to be led by the Spirit of God. And ultimately, it comes back to the Word. Now, going to the roots of the uh, Thanksgiving Day that we celebrate as Americans, and you understand that Thanksgiving Day is uniquely American. It all has its beginnings in Europe. And so we go back, and again, I don't know what you were taught about Thanksgiving, and I know that I've, I've looked online, and some of the attacks against Thanksgiving are amazing. Some of the bad information that's being put out there, some of the, the uh, criticisms of it, and some of the ways that uh, people twist things and try to make it, uh, uh, you know, out that uh, uh, Europeans came over here and oppressed the uh, uh, population, the Native Americans, the Indians that were here, and it all started back then. Listen, nothing could be further from the truth. And so let's go back to the very foundation. Now, if we're going to do this, you've got to you got to trace it back to the Pilgrims, and. Um, you know, the pilgrims, they, I'm, and I'm referring here to my notes because there's a lot of details in here and I don't want to get these things wrong. But again, the way I was taught in school is that, you know, the pilgrims came over and they were bumbling and stumbling and didn't know anything about living, you know, the hard life and they, uh, they failed and the Indians came in and rescued them and, and then they had a big celebration after that because they were thankful to the Indians or maybe even thankful to God for sending them the Indians and that they had this great feast that they shared with the Native Americans. Well, that's not what happened. What really happened goes back to the 17th century in Europe, as I said, and um, the Church of England under King James I is, uh, you know, they're, they're, he's the one that's responsible for the King James Bible, and we're grateful for that. But he also made Christianity the state religion and made the Church of England the church that everybody had to attend. Well, anytime men get involved in the religion, in, in, in spiritual things, that is, it becomes religious and uh, in many ways it becomes oppressive and it becomes controlling. So the pilgrims were a, a group of true believers who um, were being persecuted by King James in England uh, because they refused to recognize its absolute civil and spiritual authority. Now think about that. Uh, there's a lot of parallels that here the government was endeavoring to force its version of Christianity on the entire population, and these pilgrims 
uh, who were Bible people of the Word themselves, they didn't, uh, they didn't receive that. They didn't recognize His authority over them in the spiritual sense. They were Christian rebels, if you want to say it like that. And they were, they were very desirous of worshiping God freely, and as a result, they were hunted down, imprisoned, and sometimes they were even executed. Well, they were a group of separatists, Christians who didn't want to bind to the Church of England or live under the rule of King James. So they fled to Holland and they established a community for themselves there. Now, after 11 years, about 40 of them, uh, having heard about the new world that Christopher Columbus had discovered, decided that they wanted to go. And they purposed to make this perilous journey to the new world. And they knew they would face hardships, but they did it and their reason for doing it was so that they could live and worship God according to the dictates of their own consciences and beliefs. Now, there was a, 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 a compact set up on the Mayflower, the Mayflower Compact, pop, compact you've heard of it uh, historically. And it, it, it spoke to that uh, desire for men to follow their own consciences. This is God's highest and best way of leading His people, is talking to you person to person, face to face, talking to you and stirring your conscience and causing you to operate according to the new creature that you truly are. All right, so on August 1st, 1620, the Mayflower set sail. It carried a total of 102 passengers, including 40 pilgrims, uh, led by William Bradford. Now on the journey, William Bradford set up this agreement, this compact that established how they would live once they got there. And the contract set forth that just and equal laws for all members of the new community, irrespective of their religious beliefs or political beliefs, would, would be what would govern them. And where did they get this idea? They got it from the Word of God, from the Bible. Now, the pilgrims were a devoutly uh, religious people, completely steeped in the lessons of the Old and the New Testament. They looked to the Word of God. They looked to the ancient Israelites for their example. And because of the biblical precedents set forth in the scripture, they never doubted that their experiment would work. They believed in God. They believed that they were the hands of God. And of course, the, the journey which they took was no pleasure cruise. <clears throat> this was the farthest thing from a, a, a modern cruise that you could get. There was, it was wet, the weather was terrible. It was a difficult, arduous journey. And uh, it, was, it was long, no doubt. There was sickness. There was seasickness. It was the opposite of anything pleasant that you can think of today. And when they landed in New England in November, they found, according to Bradford's detailed journey, a cold, barren, desolate wilderness. There were no hotels. <laughs> there were no homes there. There were no lighthouses to guide them in. There was no place to go in and uh, have a meal and, and warm themselves by the fire. There was nothing. And the sacrifice that they had made to get there was just the beginning. Because during the first winter, half of the pilgrims, including Bradford's own wife, died either of starvation or sickness or exposure. And they endured that first winter, but at a high price. When, when spring finally came, they had by that, by that time met the local people, the indigenous Indians, and the Indians did indeed teach them how to fish, how to grow corn, how to uh, uh, skin beavers and other animals and, and provide clothing. But there still wasn't any prosperity. It still wasn't the, the paradise that they had been looking for. They did not yet prosper. They were still dependent. They were still confused. They were still in a new place, essentially alone among like-minded people. Now, this is very important to understand because this is where modern American histories often end and the wrong uh, conclusions are reached. Thanksgiving is, is uh, actually explained in some textbooks as a holiday for which the pilgrims gave thanks to the Indians for saving their lives rather than what it really was. That happened, but that's not, according to William Bradford's journal, what they ultimately gave thanks for. Now here's the part that's often been omitted. The original contract that they made on the Mayflower, the Mayflower Compact as they were traveling to the New World, they entered that contract with their merchant sponsors in London because they had no money of their own. They needed a sponsor and so they found sponsors, merchants who were willing to subsidize their trip, 
uh, for the, the prosperity that, would, that it would bring them. And uh, they agreed to a system where everything they produced went into a common store or a common account. And each member of the community was entitled to one common share in the bank. And out of this, the merchants would be repaid until they were paid off. Now, all of the land they cleared and all the houses that they built belonged to the community as well. And everything belonged to everybody and everybody had one share of it. And so what this was, was an early American experiment in communism. Now, nobody called it communism. Nobody uh, set out to say, hey, we're going to try communism. But they, they approached this from a standpoint of, you know, one for all and all for one. And, you know, thinking that it was uh, the epitome of fairness where everybody shared and shared alike. Basically, it was nothing but a commune. And uh, as a result, it didn't work. Bradford, who had become the new governor of the colony after they established it, recognized that it was not working. It was costly and destructive, according to his own journal, uh, journals. And um, Bradford assigned a plot of land to fix this to each family to work and to manage as their own. He recognized that this common uh, sharing was not working, so he gave everybody their own. And whatever they could make of it, they were entitled to do. And it was up to them. They could, whatever they produced on their land, they could keep it, they could sell it, they could share it, they could give it away, whatever they wanted to do. And what happened is that when Bradford recognized that this communist way of doing things was not working, this communal way of doing things was, uh, was failing, he, he actually uh, unleashed capitalism into America. And as a result, things changed dramatically. Um, the problem was in the, in the communal system, there was no incentive for anybody to do anything. Uh, you know, whether you worked or whether you didn't, you got to eat. Whether you, uh, whether you worked or whether you didn't, whether you got up or whether you stayed in bed, you still had a common share of everything. And so obviously, as there's going to be in any group of people, there were those that were achievers and then those that were basically lazy. And you know, this is something that the scripture deals with uh, over and over in the New Testament. Now, in the, in the Word of God, there were situations where people lived communally. Even in the early church, they tried this. And for a brief season, the Bible says that people brought, they sold lands and they brought the price to the apostles and, and they distributed it uh, equally as, as there was need. But this was not something that God established as a pattern for the early church. And William Bradford and, and the leaders recognized that there were those who were not pulling their weight. And you know what the scripture tells us in the New Testament, if a man doesn't work, neither should he eat. And so they began to do things scripturally along these lines as well. Again, good intentions, but many times good intentions bring bad results if we don't make right decisions. So here's what Bradford and his community found. And I'm gonna use basically his own words. He said, it was the most creative, industrious people but they had no incentive to work any harder than anyone else. While most of the rest of the world has been experimenting with socialism for well over 100 years, trying to refine it, perfect it, and reinvent it, the Pilgrims decided early on. William Bradford decided to scrap it permanently because it brought out the worst in human nature. It emphasized laziness and it created resentment. And you can understand that when you've got two people and one is out working and producing, the other one is not, well, when the other one gets to have the same share as the one who is out working and producing but is doing nothing simply because he's lazy, it does produce resentment. We've got that same situation uh, in, in society today. You've got resentment toward those that are freeloaders on the welfare system who won't do anything. It's different if a person can't work, but it's if a person won't work, well, who wants to support that? Uh, why, why should anybody be entitled to what you've worked hard for? They discovered this early on in the Pilgrim Society. And again, it's because in every group you got people that are self-starters and people that are movers and shakers, and then you got people that are lazy and refuse to work and blame everybody else for the problems. And there was no difference in that day than there is this day. So the resentment sprang up. 
So Bradford wrote about this. He said, For this community, so far as it was, was found to breed much confusion and discontent and retard much employment that would have been benefit, uh, would have been to their benefit and comfort. For young men that were most able and fit for labor and service did repine that they should spend their time and strength to work for other men's wives and children without any compens- uh, without any recompense, without any payment. That was thought injustice. Why should you work for other people when you can't work for yourself? What's the point? The pilgrims found that people could not be expected to do their best work without incentive. So what did Bradford's community try next? They unharnessed the power of capitalism, of good old free enterprise. And every family was assigned its own plot of land to work and permitted to market its own crops and products. And what was the result? They had very good success, wrote Bradford, for it made all hands industrious, so as much more corn was planted than otherwise would have been. Is it possible that these economics that they uh, unleashed in, in America in those days, is it possible that it was God who established this capitalist system? I believe that it was. I'm firmly convinced that God's highest and best for His people as far as any kind of governmental system and any kind of enterprise is good old-fashioned capitalism where everybody gets to stretch as far as they want to stretch, work as hard as they want to work, and be rewarded for their own labors. Praise the Lord. And so this is what they discovered in, uh, in the uh, colony back in the early days. Well, the success and the prosperity of the Plymouth settlement uh, became so pronounced and so famous that it uh, attracted more Europeans and what became, began, uh, became known to be as the Great Puritan Migration. The word of the success of the free enterprise Plymouth Colony spread like wildfire and that began the Great Migration. Everybody then wanted to be a part of it. That's where the American dream was born. It was born when the pilgrims proved that when you had government out of the way and you had the ability to work and, and uh, pursue your dream and pursue your desires and work the Word of God in the way that you treated other people, that it was success like had never been seen before. There was no wiping out of the Indians. There was no no wasting of the indigenous people, and eventually in Bradford's own journal, unleashing the industriousness of all hands, of everybody involved, ended up producing more than they could ever need themselves. And so the trading post began selling and exchanging things with the Indians, and the Indians, by the way, were very helpful. As I said earlier, they did help the pilgrims in their ignorance in those early days. But Puritan kids, Pilgrim children had relationships with the children of the Native Americans that they found. They, 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 they lived together. They worked together. They enjoyed life together. And this whole idea of killing the indigenous people and so forth, there, there were things like that that happened in American history, but it came much, much later. This was not part of the pilgrim scene. It was not part of this early Plymouth colony. It had nothing to do with the first Thanksgiving. The first Thanksgiving was William Bradford and Plymouth Colony thanking God for their blessings. And they did invite the Indians to be a part of that. But they were thanking God for His provision for them in these early days and for His restoration of them after they suffered the ravages of of, uh, leaving England and this arduous uh, uh, journey across the ocean and then the the challenges that they faced when they first set foot here. We owe them a debt of gratitude, and we owe God our thanksgiving for what they have pioneered, what they paved the way for, and we also must remember that there are times when you just have to put God first and do things His way, no matter what anybody says, government or anybody else. And so I just want to encourage you as we go into this Thanksgiving week, let's recognize that it's not just a holiday that we celebrate. It's not just a meal that we have with family. It is something that this country 
uh, it, it's a part of this country's DNA. It, it, is, it is part of the founding of our nation, recognized much, much later as an official holiday. But it was something that was part of their lifestyle and remains a part of the great American dream. So I want you to have a blessed Thanksgiving. And I want you to remember you have nothing to feel guilty for, but you have everything to be thankful for. So as an American and as a Christian, let's be doers of the Word of God. In everything, give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. If it's the will of God, according to the Word of God, then let's be doers of the will of God. Let's, this is one area where we can do the will of God and know it's the will of God in giving thanks. Giving thanks for His blessings. First of all, giving thanks for Jesus, which gives us uh, the, the very ability, the nature, the foundation for everything else good that happens in our lives. Giving thanks for our nation. Giving thanks for the pilgrims who came across and, 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 and suffered such uh, uh, amazing uh, discomforts and, and made such sacrifices, and giving thanks, and then recognizing that, hey, it's important that we keep this spirit of thanksgiving alive and that we keep this tradition of thanksgiving alive, giving alive and that we keep the American dream alive no matter what it takes. And if you'll do this, well, I'll tell you what, then we'll pass this same spirit of thanksgiving and this same American dream on to our uh, offspring onto the next generations. Praise the Lord. Well, I hope you've enjoyed that. I hope, you, hope you've learned something today. Uh, Thanksgiving's a great, great holiday, and uh, I'm excited about it. Looking forward to some good food and looking forward to some good fellowship with my family and fellow believers. So you have a great time this week. Know that you are blessed. Now, let's take the opportunity now to plant a financial seed. There on your screen is all the information you need in order to uh, plant a seed into, into this ministry. It's so important that you, you sow, that you tithe, that you give, because once again, when you do that, you are inviting God to come into your life and come into your, your circumstances and, and show His blessings and show Himself strong. So give God that opportunity. Your gift is an invitation to God to bring blessing into your life. And you know what? He'll do it because He said He would. So Take advantage of this opportunity. Go ahead and plant that seed. Thank you for all of you who support this ministry. We look forward to joining you again on Wednesday night at 7 p.m. Central Time or Sunday at 10 a.m. And remember, we are meeting live and in person on Sunday mornings at 10 a.m. Central. The address is on your screen. If you're in the area or if you uh, are, are, um, are able to, you come out and be a part of it because God does great things when we get together. We're gonna have a great time of worship this coming Sunday. So come and be a part of it. Hey, it's been great to be with you today. Again, happy Thanksgiving week, happy Thanksgiving month, happy Thanksgiving season. And this is Scott Webb reminding you that there is power in the Word of God.